Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for May 22nd through 28th, 2023. This is covering Joseph Smith Matthew, Matthew chapters 24 and 25, Mark chapters 12 through 13, and Luke chapter 21. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Welcome, scriptures. Wow. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 41 minutes, 31 seconds. Well, that, that's to be expected. It's a lot of chapters, but what would it be daily? Five minutes, 55 seconds. Excellent. Great. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it section by section. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about it all together. Now, the first 40 verses of Mark chapter 12 contain stories that we covered in our previous lesson. But let's take a look at verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living." The Institute Manual includes this insight. The mites the widow donated to the temple treasury were small Jewish coins called lepta, which is Greek for small. They weighed about a half gram, less than one-fiftieth of an ounce, and were worth less than a farthing, or quadrin, which was the Roman coin of lowest value at the time. The fact that the widow gave all that she had exemplified her sincere devotion to God, in contrast to the pretense of the scribes. Elder James E. Talmadge of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why the Lord commended the widow even though her offering was a relatively small donation. Quote, The rich gave much, yet kept back more. The widow's gift was her all. It was not the smallness of her offering that made it especially acceptable, but the spirit of sacrifice and devout intent with which she gave. End quote. That's from Elder Talmadge's book, Jesus the Christ. Elder Talmadge also stated, quote, Whether it be the gift of a man or a nation, the best, if offered willingly and with pure intent, is always excellent in the sight of God, however poor by other comparison that best may be, end quote. That is so important to understand. Remember when we had the story of the feeding of the 5,000, John tells us that it was a little lad, and what he offered wasn't much, but what God could do with it was incredible. Let's take a look now at Matthew chapter 24. The Institute Manual offers this introduction. Chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew contain what is sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, so named because the Savior delivered it on the Mount of Olives. After spending much of the final week of his mortal ministry teaching at the temple, Jesus looked back on the temple and its surrounding structures and prophesied, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Peter, James, John, and Andrew later approached Jesus privately with two questions. One, when shall these things be? referring to the destruction of the temple, and two, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? In Matthew 24 and Joseph Smith Matthew, you will study the Savior's response to these two questions. Jesus Christ addressed the first question in verses 5 through 21, and the second question is answered in verses 21 through 55. Joseph Smith Matthew is the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew chapter 23, verse 39, and Matthew chapter 24. It can be found in the Pearl of Great Price. From the Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual, we read, The prophet Joseph Smith made more changes to Matthew chapter 24 than to any other chapter in the New Testament. 
Matthew 24 in the King James Version contains 1,050 words, while Joseph Smith Matthew contains some 1,500. A major difference between Matthew 24 and Joseph Smith Matthew is that Joseph Smith Matthew clearly separates the statements Jesus made concerning the events that would take place in Jerusalem in the years shortly after his death from the events that would take place in the last days prior to his second coming. Three statements are each repeated twice in Joseph Smith Matthew, but only once in the King James Version. Also, verses 6 through 8 of Matthew 24 became Joseph Smith Matthew 23, 29, and 19, respectively. The Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 24, verse 55, is the only verse for which there is no correlating verse in the King James Version. So let's get started in Joseph Smith, Matthew, starting in verse 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that remaineth steadfast, and is not overcome, the same shall be saved. When you, therefore, shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, then you shall stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand." The seminary manual includes this quote from Elder David A. Bednar. This comes from a New Era article in January 2008. He says, quote, The word steadfast is used to suggest fixed in position, solid and firm, unshaken and resolute. A person who is steadfast and immovable is solid, firm, resolute, firmly secured, and incapable of being diverted from a primary purpose or mission. End quote. The Institute Manual has this commentary on the phrase, abomination of desolation. It says, the Bible Dictionary helps us understand what abomination of desolation means. Daniel spoke prophetically of a day when there would be the abomination that maketh desolate. And the phrase was recoined in the New Testament times to say the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Conditions of desolation born of abomination and wickedness were to occur twice in fulfillment of Daniel's words. The first was to be when the Roman legions under Titus in A.D. 70 laid siege to Jerusalem. Speaking of the last days, of the days following the restoration of the gospel and its declaration for a witness unto all nations, our Lord said, And again shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. That is, Jerusalem again will be under siege. In a general sense, the abomination of desolation also describes the latter-day judgments to be poured out upon the wicked, wherever they may be. And so, that the honest in heart may escape these things, the Lord sends his servants forth to raise the warning voice, to declare the glad tidings of the restoration, lest desolation and utter abolishment come upon them. The Institute Manual also has this great quote from Elder Dennis B. Neuenschwander, at the time serving in the presidency of the Seventy. This comes from the April 2003 General Conference. In regards to the phrase, stand in the holy place, he says, quote, For Latter-day Saints, such holy places include our homes, sacrament meetings, and temples. Much of what we reverence and what we teach our children to reverence as holy and sacred is reflected in these places. The faith and reverence associated with them and the respect we have for what transpires or has transpired in them make them holy." Wonderful. And the 2016 Seminary Manual offers this commentary. It says, In Joseph Smith Matthew, verses 13 through 18, we learn that Jesus warned his disciples to be ready to flee to the mountains and not return to their homes, because Jerusalem would be attacked and destroyed. 
he prophesied that the tribulation of those days would be the worst Israel had ever seen. In A.D. 70, approximately 40 years after Jesus spoke these words, the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem and killed over a million Jews. The temple was destroyed, and not one stone was left on top of another, just as the Savior had prophesied. However, those who heeded Jesus' warning safely escaped to Pella, a town about 50 miles northeast of Jerusalem. Nice. And with additional insight about that from the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual, we have this quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie from his book, Doctrinal New Testament Commentary. He says, quote, Some single stones were about 67 and a half feet long, 7 and a half feet high, and 9 feet broad. The pillars supporting the porches, all of one stone, were some 37 and a half feet tall. It is said that when the Romans destroyed and plowed Jerusalem, six days' battering of the walls failed to dislodge these mighty stones. The temple was, of course, finally leveled to the ground, and the stones were rooted out and scattered elsewhere. End quote. That's incredible to imagine. In Joseph Smith Matthew, verses 19 through 20, Jesus prophesied that though the Jews would suffer great trials, they would be preserved because of God's covenant with them. In addition to explaining signs that would warn of Jerusalem's destruction, the Savior answered his disciples' second question by prophesying of signs concerning his second coming. Let's pick it up in verse 21. Behold, these things I have spoken unto you concerning the Jews, and again, after the tribulation of those days which shall come upon Jerusalem, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe him not. For in those days there shall also arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if possible, they shall deceive the very elect, who are the elect according to the covenant, Behold, I speak these things unto you for the elect's sake, and you also shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all I have told you must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The 2016 Seminary Manual offers this commentary. It says, The terms false Christs and false prophets refer to anyone in and out of the church who claims to speak for the Lord without authority, or who promotes teachings that are contrary to the words of living prophets. False systems of worship may also be false Christs. The phrase, the elect according to the covenant, in verse 22, refers to members of the Church of Jesus Christ. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the terms false Christs and false prophets. Quote, When we think of false prophets and false teachers, we tend to think of those who espouse an obviously false doctrine or presume to have authority to teach the true gospel of Christ according to their own interpretation. We often assume that such individuals are associated with small radical groups on the fringes of society. However, I reiterate, there are false prophets and false teachers who have, or at least claim to have, membership in the church. There are those who, without authority, claim church endorsement to their products and practices. Beware of such. Close quote. This is from the October 1999 General Conference. Great insight. From the 2016 Seminary Manual, we get this quote from President Joseph F. Smith. This is from his book, Gospel Doctrine. He says, quote, We can accept nothing as authoritative, but that which comes directly through the appointed channel, the constituted organizations of the priesthood, which is the channel that God has appointed through which to make known his mind and will to the world. And the moment that individuals look to any other source, that moment they throw themselves open to the seductive influences of Satan and render themselves liable to become servants of the devil. They lose sight of the true order through which the blessings of the priesthood are to be enjoyed. They step outside of the pale of the kingdom of God and are on dangerous ground. Whenever you see a man rise up claiming to have received direct revelation from the Lord to the church, independent of the order and channel of the priesthood, you may set him down as an impostor. 
end quote. Good clarification. Now, we've had a lot of warnings here of dark things to come, but the Institute Manual includes a quote from President Thomas S. Monson from the April 2009 General Conference, and he talks about the phrase, be of good cheer. He says, quote, though the storm clouds may gather, though the rains may pour down upon us, our knowledge of the gospel and our love of our Heavenly Father and of our Savior will comfort and sustain us and bring joy to our hearts as we walk uprightly and keep the commandments. There will be nothing in this world that can defeat us. My beloved brothers and sisters, fear not. Be of good cheer. The future is as bright as your faith. Close quote. And you know, that reminds me of a more recent message we received from President Russell M. Nelson from the October 2022 General Conference. He says, quote, But my dear brothers and sisters, so many wonderful things are ahead. In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns with power and great glory, He will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. End quote. That is so important to remember. And exciting. Yeah. Going back to Joseph Smith Matthew, verse 24. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. From the Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual, we have this brief quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie from Doctrinal New Testament Commentary. He says, quote, If these false religious systems with their false teachers invite you to the desert to find Christ in a life of asceticism or strict self-denial, Go not forth. He is not there. If they call you to the secret chambers of monastic seclusion or withdrawal from the world to find him, believe them not. He is not there. End quote. The manual also includes another quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie from his book Millennial Messiah. It says, quote, All people shall see it together. It shall spread over all the earth as the morning light. Surely this is that of which Isaiah said, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Surely this is that of which our revelation speaks. Prepare for the revelation which is to come, when the veil of the covering of my temple In my tabernacle, which hideth the earth, shall be taken off, and all flesh shall see me together. Surely this is that day of which Zechariah prophesied, The Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day, which shall be known to the Lord, Not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Close quote. Nice. Back to Joseph Smith Matthew, verse 27. And now I show unto you a parable. Behold, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So likewise shall mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. The Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual offers this commentary, first quoting Hugh Nibley. He says, quote, The manner of the gathering, we are told, will be in the same miraculous and mysterious way as the gathering of eagles to a carcass lying in the desert. They appear suddenly and inexplicably in the four quarters of the sky and come together from vast distances to that single spot. Close quote. The manual goes on. The use of the word carcass makes one think of a dead and worthless body, but it may also refer to a structure or framework, which better fits its use in Joseph Smith Matthew verse 27. This is supported by the language in the Joseph Smith translation of Luke chapter 17 verse 37, which says, 
wheresoever the body is gathered, or, in other words, whithersoever the saints are gathered, thither will the eagles be gathered together, or thither will the remainder be gathered together. Today, the framework or body of the church is found throughout the world in stakes, wards, and branches where the eagles symbolize the saints and the continuing stream of converts who embrace the restored gospel and gather into the church. Let's go back to Joseph Smith Matthew now, verse 28. And they shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Behold, I speak for mine elect's sake. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. And again, because iniquity shall abound, the love of men shall wax cold. But he that shall not be overcome, the same shall be saved. And again, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come or the destruction of the wicked. The Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual says, The prophet Joseph Smith said, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God of Israel, anguish and wrath and tribulation, and the withdrawing of the Spirit of God await this generation, until they are visited with utter desolation. This generation is as corrupt as the generation of the Jews that crucified Christ. And if he were here today, and should preach the same doctrine he did then, they would crucify him. The manual also includes this great quote from President Ezra Taft Benson. This comes from the April 1984 General Conference. President Benson explained that when the gospel is taken to all the earth, we can know the end is near. Quote, This commission to take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people is one of the signs by which believers will recognize the nearness of the Savior's return to earth, end quote. Now, Joseph Smith Matthew verses 32 through 36 describe the additional signs associated with the second coming. Let's turn now, though, to Luke chapter 21. Here, Luke recorded additional counsel and warnings that the Savior shared about his second coming. Let's start in verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And let's pick it up again in verse 34. And take heed for yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man." The Institute Manual includes this great quote from President Dieter F. Uchtdorf. This comes from the October 2010 General Conference. President Uchtdorf taught how we can avoid being overwhelmed by the anxieties and stresses of life. He said that those who are wise, quote, resist the temptation to get caught up in the frantic rush of everyday life. They follow the advice, there is more to life than increasing its speed. In short, They focus on the things that matter most, end quote. Let's get back to Joseph Smith Matthew in verse 37. And whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived, for the Son of Man shall come, and he shall send his angels before him with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together the remainder of his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. We've got a great quote here from Elder M. Russell Ballard. This is from an Enzyme article in December of 1996. He says, quote, One of my fine missionaries who served with me when I was the mission president in Toronto, Canada, came to see me some years later. I asked him, Elder, how can I help you? President, he said, I think I'm losing my testimony. I couldn't believe it. I asked him how that could be possible. For the first time... I have read some anti-Mormon literature, he said. I have some questions and nobody will answer them for me. I'm confused and I think I'm losing my testimony. 
I asked him what his questions were, and he told me. They were the standard anti-church issues, but I wanted a little time to gather materials so I could provide meaningful answers. So we set up an appointment, ten days later, at which time I told him I would answer every one of his questions. As he started to leave, I stopped him. Elder, you've asked me several questions here today, I said. Now I have one for you. Yes, President? How long has it been since you read from the Book of Mormon? I asked. His eyes dropped. He looked at the floor for a while. Then he looked at me. It's been a long time, President, he confessed. All right, I said. You have given me my assignment. It's only fair that I give you yours. I want you to promise me that you will read in the Book of Mormon for at least one hour every day between now and our next appointment. He agreed that he would do that. Ten days later, he returned to my office, and I was ready. I pulled out my papers to start answering his questions, but he stopped me. President, he said, that isn't going to be necessary. Then he explained, I know that the Book of Mormon is true. I know Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. Well, that's great, I said, but you're going to get answers to your questions anyways. I worked a long time on this, so you just sit there and listen. (laughs) And so I answered all his questions and then asked, Elder, what have you learned from this? And he said, give the Lord equal time, close quote. Oh, that's great. I love that. So true. Going back to Joseph Smith Matthew, verse 38 Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branches are yet tender, and it begins to put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh at hand. So likewise mine elect, when they shall see all these things, they shall know that he is near, even at the doors. But of that day and hour no one knoweth, no, not the angels of God in heaven, but my Father only. The Pearl of Great Price Institute manual has this commentary. It says concerning the Savior's coming, the prophet Joseph Smith said, Jesus Christ never did reveal to any man the precise time that he would come. Go and read the scriptures and you cannot find anything that specifies the exact hour he would come. And all that say so are false teachers. Hmm. Back to Joseph Smith, Matthew, verse 41. But as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be also at the coming of the Son of Man. For it shall be with them as it was in the days which were before the flood. For until the day that Noah entered into the ark, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The Pearl of Great Price Institute manual includes a couple of quotes from Elder Neil A. Maxwell. The first is from his book, Sermons Not Spoken. He says, quote, As in the days of Noah, people will also be preoccupied with the cares and the pleasures of the world. Ironically, most, therefore, will even miss such signs as God gives pertaining to Jesus' glorious second coming. Close quote. He also said, quote, It is no accident that the scriptures have preserved for us certain precious insights about the times in which Noah lived. Those were times, we read, that were filled with violence and corruption abounded. There was apparently a sense of self-sufficiency, a condition to which Jesus called attention. Jesus said this condition would be repeated in the last days. The people of Noah's time were desensitized to real dangers. So we may become in our time. Noah and those with him had to let go of their world or perish with it. Close quote. That last quote is from his book, Wherefore Ye Must Press Forward. Nice, I like that. Back to Joseph Smith Matthew, verse 44. Then shall be fulfilled that which is written, that in the last days two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. The Pearl of Great Price Institute manual includes this quote from President Heber C. Kimball of the First Presidency. He says, quote, The servants of God are angels in one sense, sent forth to gather the house of Israel from the four corners of the earth. And the elders of this church, in their labors, have fulfilled partly the sayings of the Savior when they have found two working in the field. One has received the gospel and been gathered, and the other left, two working in a mill, 
One has been taken, and the other left. Two lying in a bed. The one has been taken, and the other left. But no doubt these sayings will have their final and complete fulfillment about the time of the second coming of the Savior. Close quote. This was recorded in the Deseret News in March of 1863. Back to Joseph Smith Matthew, verse 46. And what I say unto one, I say unto all men, Watch, therefore, for you know not at what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to have been broken up, but would have been ready. The Pearl of Great Price Institute manual includes a quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. This is from his book, Mormon Doctrine. He says, quote, Those who treasure up his word will not be deceived as to the time of that glorious day, nor as to the events to proceed and to attend it. The righteous will be able to read the signs of the times. To those in darkness, he will come suddenly, unexpectedly, as a thief in the night. But to the children of light, who are not of the night, nor of the darkness, as Paul expressed it, that day will not overtake them as a thief. They will recognize the signs as certainly as a woman in travail foreknows the approximate time of her child's birth. Close quote. Back to Joseph Smith, Matthew, verse 48. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and a wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. And verily I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods, But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and shall appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Pearl of Great Price Institute manual offers this commentary. In Joseph Smith, Matthew, verse 49, the Lord asked a piercing question. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? It is a question similar to the ones asked in Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? And in Malachi 3, verse 2, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. These are questions we should each ask ourselves. Faithful and wise servants can always be found doing what they have been commanded to do, such as giving meat in due season, meaning food at the proper time, to the households over which they have been made rulers. Such servants will be given responsibility over all their master's possessions. The evil servant will rationalize that he will do what he has been commanded later, and instead of feeding his household as he should, he will begin to abuse his fellow servants and feed himself along with other drunkards. And the Lord will come to the evil servant at a time he least expects and is least prepared. The evil servant will not be made a ruler but will be cut asunder and appointed his portion with the hypocrites. The seminary manual includes this great quote from Elder Neil L. Anderson. This comes from the April 2015 General Conference. He says, quote, The thought of his coming stirs my soul. It will be breathtaking. The scope and grandeur, the vastness and magnificence will exceed anything mortal eyes have ever seen or experienced. In that day... He will appear in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels. The sun and the moon will be transformed, and stars will be hurled from their places. We will kneel in reverence, and the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it. In that day the skeptics will be silent. For every ear shall hear, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior and Redeemer of the world. 
May we prepare for his coming by rehearsing these glorious events over and over in our own minds and with those we love. End quote. Beautiful. Back to Joseph Smith Matthew, verse 55. And thus cometh the end of the wicked, according to the prophecy of Moses, saying, They shall be cut off from among the people. But the end of the earth is not yet, but by and by. The Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual says the end of the world is the end of wickedness, but the end of the earth occurs when this earth is transformed into a celestial kingdom. President Brigham Young said, quote, When the Savior has completed the work, when the faithful saints have preached the gospel to the last of the spirits who have lived here and who are designed to come to this earth, when the thousand years of rest shall come and thousands and thousands of temples shall be built and the servants and handmaids of the Lord shall have entered therein and officiated for themselves and for their dead friends back to the days of Adam, when the last of the spirits in prison who will receive the gospel has received it, when the Savior comes and receives his ready bride, and all who can be are saved in the various kingdoms of God, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial, according to their several capacities and opportunities, when sin and iniquity are driven from the earth, and the spirits that now float in this atmosphere are driven into the place prepared for them, When the earth is sanctified from the effects of the fall and baptized, cleansed, and purified by fire and returns to its paradisiacal state and has become like a sea of glass, a Urim and Thummim, when all this is done and the Savior has presented the earth to his Father and it is placed in the cluster of the celestial kingdoms, And the Son and all his faithful brethren and sisters have received the welcome plaudit. Enter ye into the joy of your Lord. And the Savior is crowned. Then, and not till then, will the saints receive their everlasting inheritances. This was published in the Deseret News in August of 1874. Nice. The Institute Manual also includes this great quote from President Dallin H. Oaks. This comes from the April 2004 General Conference. He says, quote, While we are powerless to alter the fact of the second coming and unable to know its exact time, we can accelerate our own preparation and try to influence the preparation of those around us. What if the day of his coming were tomorrow? If we knew that we would meet the Lord tomorrow, through our premature death or through his unexpected coming, what would we do today? What confessions would we make? What practices would we discontinue? What accounts would we settle? What forgivenesses would we extend? What testimonies would we bear? If we would do those things then, why not now? Why not seek peace while peace can be obtained? If our lamps of preparation are drawn down, let us start immediately to replenish them. Wonderful. Let's move now to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 is a continuation of the Savior's teaching on the Mount of Olives. The three parables in Matthew 25 each teach how to be prepared to meet the Lord when he comes again. Let's start in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The Institute Manual tells us, The parable of the ten virgins alludes to several Jewish wedding customs. Traditionally, the bridegroom, accompanied by his close friends, would go at night to the bride's house. Following the completion of the wedding ceremonies there, the wedding party would proceed to the groom's house for a feast. Wedding guests who joined the procession were expected to carry their own lamps or torches. The bridegroom in this parable represents the Savior, and his arrival with the wedding procession represents his second coming. The tarrying of the bridegroom teaches that the Lord has his own timetable for his second coming. 
Great. And here's some additional helpful information from the seminary manual. It says, modern-day revelation and prophetic teachings can help you understand symbolic meanings in the parable. The bridegroom is symbolic of the Savior, and the coming of the bridegroom represents the second coming. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency taught, quote, The ten virgins obviously represent members of Christ's church, for all were invited to the wedding feast and all knew what was required to be admitted when the bridegroom came. Close quote. This is from an April 2004 general conference. The lamps can symbolize our testimonies. Note that all ten virgins had lamps. The oil can symbolize our conversion unto the Lord Jesus Christ. This can include our efforts to follow the guidance of the Holy Ghost and to live obediently to the Savior and His gospel. Back to Matthew 25, verse 5. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The seminary manual says most Jewish wedding ceremonies would take place in the evening. Several scripture passages refer to the Savior coming again like a thief in the night. The coming of the bridegroom at midnight suggests the unexpected hour of the Savior's return. President Spencer W. Kimball explained, quote, The foolish virgins were not averse to buying oil. They knew they should have oil. They merely procrastinated not knowing when the bridegroom would come. Midnight is so late for those who have procrastinated. Close quote. This is from his book, Faith Precedes the Miracle. Too true. Going on in verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The 2016 seminary manual says the phrase, trimmed their lamps, means that the virgins cut the wicks of their lamps in a way that would allow for a bright flame. Right. Verse 8. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Or as the Joseph Smith translation in the footnote tells us, Ye know me not. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. From the October 2014 General Conference, Sister Linda K. Burton offers this insight. She says, quote, I don't think there is anyone especially among those with tender hearts, who doesn't feel sad for the foolish young women. And some of us just want to say to the others, can't you just share so everyone can be happy? But think about it. This is a story the Savior told, and He is the one who calls five of them wise and five of them foolish. As we consider this parable as a pattern for temple preparation, consider the words of a Latter-day prophet who taught that the oil of spiritual preparedness cannot be shared. President Spencer W. Kimball helped clarify why the five wise young women could not share the oil in their lamps with those who were foolish when he said, Attendance at sacrament meetings adds oil to our lamps, drop by drop over the years. Fasting, family prayer, home teaching, control of bodily appetites, preaching the gospel, studying the scriptures, each act of dedication and obedience is a drop added to our store. Deeds of kindness, payment of offerings and tithes, chaste thoughts and actions, these too contribute importantly to the oil with which we can at midnight refuel our exhausted lamps. Sister Burton continues, Can you see the pattern of preparedness, drop by drop, that can help us as we think how we might be more diligent in our preparation to receive sacred ordinances for ourselves and others? What other small and simple things might we do to add precious spiritual drops of oil to our lamps of preparation? Close quote. I love that. From the seminary manual, we have this quote from Elder David A. Bednar from the October 2016 General Conference. He says, quote, 
A grand objective of mortality is not merely learning about the only begotten of the Father, but also striving to know him. We come to know the Savior as we do our best to go where he wants us to go, as we strive to say what he wants us to say, and as we become what he wants us to become. End quote. I love that concept. You know, there's another great quote from the Institute Manual. This is from President Henry B. Eyring from the April 2007 General Conference. And he said, quote, There is a danger in the word someday when what it means is not this day. Someday I will repent. Someday I will forgive him. Someday I will speak to my friend about the church. Someday I will start to pay tithing. Someday I will return to the temple. Someday. The scriptures make the danger of delay clear. It is that we may discover that we have run out of time. Close quote. Wonderful counsel. Now let's take a look at the second parable, starting in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. President James E. Faust from the October 2002 General Conference said, quote, The Lord entrusts all of his servants, including every priesthood holder, with spiritual talents. While we are not all equal in experience, aptitude, and strength, we have different opportunities to employ these spiritual gifts, and we will all be accountable for the use of the gifts and opportunities given to us. Close quote. Nice. Going on, verse 16. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came, and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. The term usury can refer to simply charging interest on a loan or can imply an unduly high interest rate, according to the Bible Dictionary. Right. Verse 28. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Institute Manual says, In the Savior's time, a talent was a unit of weight and also a large sum of money. In modern usage, the word talent, as used in this parable, has come to represent any spiritual gift or any skill or ability given to us by God. And the parable teaches that we are responsible to use these gifts wisely and profitably. The second coming is represented by the arrival, after a long time, of a master who had entrusted his servants with talents. 
The servant who doubled his two talents received the same commendation as the one who doubled his five talents. Each was expected to try to improve on what he had been given. Thus, in the end, only the servant who did nothing with his talent was rejected by his master. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency explained that the Lord will hold all people accountable for what they do with their talents. Quote, Some of us are too content with what we may already be doing. We stand back in the eat, drink, and be merry mode when opportunities for growth and development abound. We miss opportunities to build up the kingdom of God because we have the passive notion that someone else will take care of it. The Lord tells us that he will give more to those who are willing. They will be magnified in their efforts. But to those who say, we have enough, from them shall be taken away, even that which they have. Close quote. That's from the October 2002 General Conference. The 2016 Seminary Manual includes this quote from Elder Quentin L. Cook. This comes from the October 1996 General Conference. He says, quote, The growth in our own talents is the best measure of personal progress. Comparing blessings is almost certain to drive out joy. We cannot be grateful and envious at the same time. If we truly want to have the Spirit of the Lord and experience joy and happiness, we should rejoice in our blessings and be grateful. End quote. From that same manual, it has a quote from Elder Sterling W. Sill. This is from his book, The Law of the Harvest. He says, quote, The third servant's loss was not because he did anything wrong, but rather because his fear had prevented him from doing anything at all. Yet this is the process by which most of our blessings are lost. When one fails to use the muscles of his arm, he loses his strength. When we don't develop our abilities, we lose our abilities. When the people in past ages have not honored the priesthood, it has been taken from them. Neither spiritual, mental, nor physical talents develop while they are buried in the earth. Close quote. If I could, let me just insert a thought here. And I do so cautiously because I don't want this to be misunderstood. But imagine for a minute a pretend scale of spiritualness. So like in the upper levels, you have 9, 10, that level. And then at the bottom, someone who's a 1. In the same way, this parable of the talents, there's nothing wrong with having the one talent. But one thing we might misunderstand is that if we have a two or a three, that maybe we don't think that's as valuable as someone who's a five or a six. Do not be deceived. Wherever we are on the scale, it's because of what the Lord has given us. And we're not permanently at any place in that scale. But imagine this. Say you are a two or three. Could it be that you're in a much better position to help someone who's at a spiritual one than someone who's, say, at a spiritual seven? And what if you're at a four or five? Aren't you in a better place to help those that are at a two or a three? Again, I don't think there's such a thing as this pretend spiritual scale, because there's so much nuance in how we develop and the gifts that we have. But I hope this helps you to see that wherever you are, there are people you can help that no one else can. Maybe it's your personality. Maybe it's your level of growth. Maybe it's your difficult and challenging experiences that you've faced. Wherever you are, the Lord can and will and desires to use you to bless the lives of others in ways that no one else can. For those of you who have children, have you ever seen that happen? Have you ever seen an older sibling teach a younger sibling something that you've been trying to tell them, but they just haven't understood? Right. Let's get back to the chapter, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. So let's see how the Lord determines if one is a sheep or a goat. First, the sheep. Let's pick it up in verse 34. 
Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And now let's take a look at the goats. Verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And let's finish this up with this quote included in the seminary manual. It's from Elder Joseph B. Worthlin from the October 2007 General Conference. Quote, At the final day, the Savior will not ask about the nature of our callings. He will not inquire about our material possessions or fame. He will ask if we ministered to the sick, gave food and drink to the hungry, visited those in prison or gave succor to the weak. When we reach out to assist the least of Heavenly Father's children, we do it unto Him. That is the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Close quote. Maybe it would be a good exercise to ponder how you've treated others in the last 24 hours. Consider whether you would choose to act differently if you were in a similar situation in the future. Considering what we've learned today, what would you change and why? And if you would change it, why not today? Remember what Elder Eyring said, someday is a dangerous word. Now we're nearing the end of the Savior's ministry. There's still a lot more to come and a lot more to talk about. So keep reading your scriptures and we'll talk to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans, 